Shift Show. I am recording this podcast from my condo in Puerto Rico. And those of you who were concerned about uh, Puerto Rico and my uh, property down here, I appreciate some of the thoughts. Fortunately, the island was spared. As you may or may not have heard, the, the uh, Hurricane Irma didn't quite make it to Puerto Rico. It, I mean, it went by us, you know, it was north of Puerto Rico, but it actually took a very convenient a turn kind of last minute to keep it further offshore. So, you know, we got a lot of downed uh, branches and stuff on the ground, but all of the really the, the foliage is fine. It's still very, very lush here. Uh, minimal damage. Of course, the power's out. The power's still out of my house. It's out all over here. None of the street lights are working. Uh, so we do have that problem. But, you know, Puerto Rico has problems with the power grid, even without uh, Hurricane Irma. You know, I think the hurricane is going to end up being a net positive for Puerto Rico. I mean, first of all, they were good because uh, the president declared it a disaster area even before the hurricane hit, which was a good thing because maybe they wouldn't have declared it a disaster area had they actually come down here and you know waited until after the hurricane and saw that it kind of missed the island. But it's still a disaster area. But I bet there's going to be a lot of uh, money because the, you know, the president, Congress, everybody's going to be tripping over each other to show how compassionate they are and how much they care. And they're going to be giving out a lot of money to people in Texas and Florida. So obviously they can't overlook uh, Puerto Rico. I mean, that would open them up to, oh, what are you, a racist or who knows? So I'm sure that Puerto Rico is going to get a lot of money and they're going to be able to make some badly needed repairs uh, to the infrastructure down here, particularly uh, the power grid uh, that needed to be made anyway. You know, it's kind of like you get into an accident in your car and you happen to have a lot of other dents uh, in the car. And so when you go and you take your car in, you know, to get an estimate to give to the insurance company, you have, you know, you throw it all in there. And so you end up parlaying a little bit uh, because you actually are fixing damage that you had before the accident, but you're trying to throw it all in there because you're putting in a claim uh, for the insurance company and you know, you're trying to uh, make the most out of your claim. And so a lot of people do that. And I think the same thing is gonna happen here with Puerto Rico. Uh, they're gonna get money to do stuff that really has nothing to do with the, with the hurricane. But of course, there was no political will in Congress to you know, give aid to Puerto Rico because they're broke and they borrowed too much money. Right. That, you know, that was somehow a bailout for the banks or whoever it was being portrayed in the media. But obviously, nobody is going to be against aid for disaster relief. So this is going to work out for Puerto Rico. In fact, I think if you look at what's happened in the Caribbean, you had some of the islands really got decimated. I mean, when uh, Irma was a category five, I mean, the eye actually went right over a few of these islands and they got hit. Uh, with the full strength. I mean, look at what happened to the British Virgin Islands, uh, St. Martin, uh, then Anguilla, St. Bart's, uh, uh, Barbuda. Uh, even the U.S. Virgin Islands has some damage, Turks and Caicos. I mean, some of them obviously worse than others, but a lot of damage to the infrastructure, to the airports, to the hotels. I mean, a lot of these islands are just going to be completely out of this uh, season's tourists. I mean, obviously, people that have hotels that they booked uh, at St. Martin or the BVI or, you know, any of these places, they're going to have to cancel those reservations. Now, if they still want to go to the Caribbean, they're going to have to choose from among the islands that didn't get hit. So those islands that were fortunate enough to be missed, now they're going to have a lot of demand for their hotels. And, and so it's going to actually be a positive for some of these islands, although it's certainly going to run up construction costs all over uh, the Caribbean and uh, insurance costs. I mean, insurance rates are going to really go through the roof, even for people who didn't put in claims because, you know, the insurance companies, they lose a lot of money and now they have got to recoup those losses. Same thing is going to happen in the U.S. You know, the hurricane was not as bad because by the time Irma made it to Florida, first of all, it, it, it veered west. There was a lot of fear on Friday that it was going to go and make landfall as a category four or five right in Miami, and then go up the East Coast through all the very expensive real estate on the East Coast, which includes one of my homes, by the way. I've got a house down there as well. Um, but there, there, there was some thought that that's what was going to happen. And then they'd have this huge storm surge. And instead, Irma took a shift to the West, and it didn't really make landfall 
until it was down, at, I think, at Category 3 or down to 2. I mean, it was, you know, off the coast of Florida, off the West Coast, and it certainly did a lot of damage, but it didn't do the apocalyptic-type damage that was done, you know, to, 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 to some of these Caribbean islands that, that took direct hits when the hurricane was at full strength. So the, the damage wasn't as big, but still, there's going to be a lot of insured losses down there. The insurance companies are going to pay out. And, of course, they don't know, right? All of a sudden, we had two Cat 5 hurricanes form in the Caribbean at the same time. That's very rare because um, the other one, Jose, um, happened to go up north. And so we're lucky on that one. And we just, you know, we had that big Category 4 um, that hit in Texas. So maybe the insurance companies are thinking, is this a new thing? Are we going to go a few years with some real big hurricanes making landfall? Because you don't know. I mean, is this an aberration or is this the start of a new trend? So I'm sure that you're going to see rising uh, insurance rates, which again, which are going to be a, uh, a, a negative for U.S. consumers who have to pay more money to, uh, to, buy, uh, to buy insurance. And of course, you know, a lot of the insurance companies, if they have to raise money to pay claims, Where's that money coming from? It's got to come from the markets. It's just not sitting there in a piggy bank. It's invested in stocks and bonds. And so if they're going to pay claims, you know, you would think that that would be a little bit of a negative for the financial markets as these insurance companies have to liquidate some of their portfolios to pay claims. But not today. Right. The markets rallied all over the world. It was a huge relief rally. I think that the hurricane was not as bad as people feared. So you had stocks going up all around the world. The Dow was up 200 and 50 points today. I mean, huge day. Everything was up. Of course, all the foreign markets, European markets, Asian markets, every market rallied. It was a huge risk on day. So stocks went up and bonds got clobbered, right? Yields rose on the government bonds, the 10-year out to the 30-year. It's risk on, right? So you get rid of your safe assets, although I don't know why anybody would consider treasuries safe, but hey, everybody sells their treasuries and they buy U.S. stocks. And they sold gold. Gold was down 19 bucks today. This is the biggest move I've seen in a day in, in a while. In fact, this 19-day down move, gold has been moving up steadily from like low 1200 it's almost 1200 even, to 1350 last week. I don't think I've ever seen a $19 update. Gold's been going up slowly, $5, $7, $3. Maybe there was one $10 day, I think. But it's been a very slow, steady climb on a wall of worry. And now all of a sudden we have a day where everybody's excited because the hurricane didn't do you know, as much damage as it could have. And they all buy stocks and they dump gold and it goes down 19 bucks in one day. Now, I don't even think the gold rally had anything to do with fears over the hurricane damage. I mean, it's possible that there was a little bit of it, but I really doubt it because gold had been rallying steadily before these hurricanes even came around. And I don't think any of this gain was necessarily the result of the hurricanes. Had none of these hurricanes showed up, gold could still have been exactly where it was. I mean, gold was rallying anyway. I didn't see a big rush into gold uh, as a result of these hurricanes, but I'm seeing a rush out. And again, this is basically the way bull markets work. When you have a bull market, the biggest moves are down. Just like in a bear market, the biggest moves are up because you have, you know, you, you have, you're trying to create fear. You're trying to shake out weak people, right? So a bull market climbs a wall of worry. The sharp declines supply the worry. So you had a big sharp decline because, hey, the hurricane could have been worse. So some people sold gold. They bought stocks. The smart money is taking the other side of this trade, buying the gold on this dip buying the gold stocks on this dip, because we are going to get news. I mean, the news is going to come out, the flooding, the damage. There is a lot of damage here, a lot of damage to infrastructure. Who knows how long it's going to take for Florida to get their power back. In the meantime, there's a lot of economic activity that's not taking place. A lot of flights have been canceled. I mean, all over the place, flights that aren't even down here. I mean, the airlines are going to lose a ton of money off of this. Think, you know, think about all these planes that are just sitting there that aren't being used. Uh, so there's there's a lot of uh, problems that are going to result from these uh, hurricanes. And we're going to learn about that as the days progress. And so the markets will have plenty of bad news uh, to chew on, even if they want to celebrate today. But meanwhile, so all my foreign stocks were way up today, except my gold stocks. I had some huge gainers today. The dollar, on the other hand, 
did move up. So that took a little bit of the benefit away from the rise in the foreign stocks. But the dollar index still just below 92. It's not like this rally has really taken us anywhere. I think we closed around 91, 93. So we had a little bit of a rally. The dollar was at the lows for the year at the end of last week. This is a little bit of a dead cat bounce. I don't really see anything here. And it's interesting, though, that the dollar is rallying on a risk on day, right? Not a risk off day, a risk on day. And I've made this point before in this podcast. Everybody thinks the dollar is a safe haven. Well, if it's a safe haven, the dollar should be rallying on the risk off days, right? When people are worried and concerned about things, that's when they look for a safe haven. When you're all excited and looking to be aggressive and you think everything is great, you don't want the safe haven, right? You want to take risk. You want to get in on the action. So people want to get in on the action. Now they're buying the dollar. The dollar is part of the action. The dollar is a risk asset, and that makes a lot more sense. It never should have been a safe haven. It was a safe haven in 2008, and probably because it was at an all-time record low. Everybody had been short in the dollar for years. That was the bottom of a six-year bear market, where the dollar index went from 120 to 70. And so maybe that was just people reversing their trades because they got blindsided by what happened. But if you look at what the dollar is doing now, the dollar is a risk asset. And I don't know, you know, I I mentioned this before about Jim Rogers. I got a lot of respect for Jim Rogers. He's a very smart guy, but he's sitting there on a pile of dollars. He's as bearish as I am long term on the U.S. market, on the economy, on the dollar. But he's holding dollars because he thinks that as all this bad stuff starts to happen, there's going to be a big rally in the dollar. And then he's going to sell his dollars and take a profit and buy the currencies that he really likes. Well, there's nothing that I'm seeing in the market that suggests that that's going to happen. The dollar is not trading like a safe haven. The dollar is trading like a risk asset. It's the Swiss franc. It's the Japanese yen that are the safe havens. It's gold that's the safe haven. And by the way, Bitcoin trades more like a risk asset, which is what it is, than a safe haven. I see no indication that people buy Bitcoin when they're worried about stuff. You know, there were a few times where people bought Bitcoin. Let's say there's a country where all of a sudden there's a problem and people are having trouble getting their money out of a country. Sometimes there could be some bids in Bitcoin because people are trying to buy something that they can that they can you know use to get out of the banking system. So sometimes you see that. But by and large, I don't see Bitcoin trading like bonds or or gold. To me, it trades like a like it like a social media stock only on steroids. Right. So it goes up when there's a risk on day, although not today. I mean, every all these risky assets rose, but Bitcoin didn't rise today. But I think there's a lot of people who expect that if we have a real disaster and everything hits the fan, that Bitcoin is going to be a safe haven and it's going to rise. I don't think so. I think it's more likely that it's going to go down. I mean, if the stock market comes crashing down, there's a good chance that Bitcoin is going to come crashing down with it because there's all this speculative money in there. And if the speculators start losing and they want to run for cover, then they sell all the assets that they're speculating on. And that would include Bitcoin. And especially if that happens at a time where gold is rising. And if gold is rising and these cryptocurrencies are falling, then that's going to accelerate the rush to get out of a speculative alternative asset into a traditional safe haven asset like uh, like gold. Hey, by the way, you know, I did my uh, video blog on the debt ceiling, which apparently, not only did we just uh, extend the suspension of the debt ceiling. Remember, the last couple of times, they didn't even raise the ceiling anymore. Nobody wanted to vote to raise the ceiling. Nobody wanted to vote for a debt ceiling over $20 trillion. So all they did is they voted to suspend the ceiling. So there was no ceiling for a while. Like the sky was the limit, but there was a, a, a time limit on how long the, the, the debt ceiling was, was in suspension. And so as we were getting closer to that time limit, you know, they had to cook the books. They had to find ways of spending money, but not counting it. They had a lot of stuff that was off the books. Then all of a sudden, Trump and the Democrats decide to kick the can down the road and extend the suspension till December. And all of a sudden, all this spending that was off the books, all of a sudden it's on the books. And the debt, the national debt jumped by over 300 billion dollars today and now we're over 20 trillion for the first time i'm looking at the national debt clock if you've never been over there just go it's it's usdebtclock.org 
and it's at 20 trillion 164 billion. So I mean, we already got a good start up to 21 trillion. We'll be up at 21 trillion, uh, you know, quickly. You know, especially if they get rid of the debt ceiling completely, which is now what Donald Trump apparently is going to do with the full support of the Democrats. Because you know, the Democrats have always wanted to get rid of the debt ceiling, right? I mean, they don't. They don't. They want to just spend as much money as possible. They don't want any limit on the amount of money they spend. It's the Republicans who never really wanted to get rid of it. I mean, they never even liked to vote to raise it. I mean, they were embarrassed. The Republicans, you know, they had to vote to raise the debt ceiling late at night. You know, they'd have to stick it in some bill that nobody knew was there because they didn't want to raise it. They don't want to go home and campaign about fiscal responsibility. We need a, a balanced budget amendment and then vote to raise the debt ceiling. That's probably one of the worst votes that Republicans could make is raise the debt ceiling, right? The Democrats, yeah, they're all fine with the debt. They don't care. But so now they got a Republican president who's willing to get rid of that debt ceiling. All the Democrats are going to be behind that. Of course, there'll be some Republicans that'll fall on board. So if, as long as you got a Republican who's willing to sign on to that, then that's what's going to happen, right? We're, they're going to get rid of the debt ceiling. And we got $20 trillion in debt with a debt ceiling. Imagine, imagine how much more debt we're going to have without the ceiling. Now, yes, they had to raise the ceiling. It was an annoyance, right? Every time we got up there, they went through this whole big charade and, oh, we're going to shut down the government. But I have to believe that the debt ceiling was a little bit of a break. I mean, obviously, it wasn't a ceiling where, you know, it, it would just go up automatically. They had to raise it. And I'm sure that as they got close to it, there were some cuts somewhere to the rate of increase that it was a little bit of a break. I mean, not much, obviously, but a little bit. But I mean, once you get rid of it, I mean, that's it. There's nothing left. And at least, I guess, the debt ceiling, our creditors say, OK, you know, there's some kind of limit. And remember, when I ran for Senate, the thing that I wanted to do, this was my stump speech when I ran for Senate, was send me to the United States Senate and I will be the vote that never, the guy that never votes to raise the debt ceiling. I will filibuster. It'll be like one big podcast or at the top, you know, I'm just going to stand up there as long as I can and I will filibuster any attempt to raise that debt ceiling. And I'll try to get as many senators as possible to prevent the debt ceiling from going up. Because if I could have done that, if I could have convinced enough uh, senators not to increase the debt ceiling, I would have forced the budget into balance. They would have no choice but to massively cut government spending. So that was what I wanted to do. And obviously, somebody else could do that. But if they get rid of the debt ceiling, nobody can do that. You, the only tool that we potentially had to put a break on runaway government spending is the failure to raise the debt ceiling. And it's interesting, too. That, you know, the, 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 the spin has been that, you know, it's irresponsible. These Republicans are threatening not to raise the debt ceiling. We have to raise the debt ceiling. That's the responsible thing to do. We have to raise the debt ceiling. America always pays its bills. I mean, I would laugh. We never pay our bills, right? That's why we have all this debt. If we always paid our bills, there'd be no debt. Why do we have 20 trillion in debt? Because those are 20 trillion of unpaid bills. That's what they are. I mean, do you pay your MasterCard with your Visa? And then say, hey, I just paid off my MasterCard. Yeah, but look, now it's all on my visa. It doesn't count as paying if you're borrowing the money. And so it was all like a, a, a chapter right out of an Orwell novel that they were able to convince the public that the responsible thing to do is go deeper into debt to prove that you pay your bills when it's actually the opposite. But this getting rid of this debt ceiling, this is just going to pave the way for what I've always known was going to happen. We're going to have runaway deficits. You know, they're going to have this infrastructure. They're going to have the money to, you know, to bail out the, the disaster relief. We're going to have some kind of tax cut, especially if Trump is going to start working with uh, the Democrats. There's a lot of things they could do, a lot of bad stuff. This bipartisanship, this is about the worst thing that you can have, right? The media wants to play it up like this is some great kumbaya. They all get along. Yeah, they all get along to pick our pockets. They all vote for the other guy's bad things. It's all pork. Right. All the bad spending gets in. Everybody gets what they want. Everybody gets to be Santa Claus. Right. Republicans get some tax cuts. The Democrats get to spend more money on stuff. And no one cares about the debt because it's just going to blow through the ceiling. That's no longer no longer exists. So this is all bad news. And this is going to weigh on the dollar. I mean, this one day rally isn't going to matter. 
bigger deficits, U.S. economy slowing down. You know, even if the Fed was thinking about raising rates, I don't know. Are they going to do it now with all the uncertainty, all the you know potential fallout from these hurricanes and these disasters? I mean, I think the market now has reduced the probability of a rate hike this year or December rate hike down to about 20, 25 percent. Uh, so most people don't think the Fed is going to raise rates anymore this year. And I think if we get through this year without a rate hike, then we're probably not going to have any more. Probably the next thing the Fed is going to do is cut rates. And I don't even think the dollar has begun to price in that. I don't think gold has begun to, to price in that. Of course, I don't want to forget with all the talk of the natural disasters to point out the 16th anniversary of the man-made disaster, the terrorist attack that happened on September 11th, 2001. You know, it's hard to believe that 16 years have already gone by uh, since that tragic event. And of course, we're living uh, with the tragedy. Many people personally who lost uh, loved ones uh, will never be able to uh, get over that. But the economy is still being affected. I mean, obviously, every time we go to an airport and we're uh, scrutinized, you know, we think about September 11th, because after all, that's where all this added security came from, you know, when they when they took my uh, shaving lotion or my my sunscreen the last time I was I had it in my carry on. I mean, apparently that's all to make sure that there's not another terrorist attack. You know, the the uh, Department of Homeland Security did not exist prior to the September 11th terrorist attack. And now we have that. So a lot of things happened. The Patriot Act exists today as a result of the uh, the terrorist act. I mean, that's, again, probably one of the most unpatriotic pieces of legislation ever passed. You know, if there was ever truth in legislating, you know, like the government requires all private industries to label their products, you, know, you can't be deceptive in the way you label your products. Well, but the government is very deceptive in the way they label their legislation, because generally whatever the name of the legislation is, the actual effect of the bill is the opposite of the name. Like, Tax simplification is, in fact, tax complication. But nobody wants to vote for more complicated taxes, so they complicate the tax code by calling it simplification. Nobody wants to vote for the unpatriotic act, so they put a bunch of unpatriotic things in some legislation, and they call it the Patriot Act because they, you know, they're able to uh, pass it when there's an emergency, when there's a war. You know, I mentioned in uh, my, my video blog when I was talking about the national debt, uh, the debt ceiling came in because they changed the Federal Reserve Act to allow the Federal Reserve to buy U.S. Treasuries. When did they do it? During World War I, right? So the government usurped a lot of power. You know, the original uh, gift tax and inheritance tax, they came in to fight World War I. That's where they came from. They never went away. In fact, the very first income tax came in during the Civil War. That was the first time they had one. The war was over. They ended it. But that's the precedent. That's where they created it. The same thing for paper money. First time the government printed paper money was during the Civil War. They stopped when the war was over, but then they resurrected it later on. But the income tax, the withholding tax, that was part of the victory tax. They got that for World War II. We won the war, but we lost because the taxes that we passed to fight the war never went away when the war was over. You know, the, 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 the telephone excise tax, we're still paying that. I pay that on my cell phone. Why do we have a federal telephone tax? It was part of the victory tax. We didn't have it before World War II. During World War II, the government needed money, so they passed the telephone excise tax, right? Then the war was over. All the troops came home. The tax stayed. So, you know, whenever they have a war, the government gets more power. And then when the war is over, they don't give it up. And then another war comes along, they grab even more power which is why the governments like war. One of the reasons that they're warmongers is they know that when there's a war, they can get away with anything because no one's going to be against legislation during a war because, after all, you're not a patriot. you got to rally around the flag. you got to do whatever Congress wants to do. And, of course, you know, during you know, the war, like, was anyone going to object to the withholding tax during the Second World War? I mean, most people were fighting the war. If you were stateside and you had a job, are you going to object to paying income taxes when the money is going 
to, you know, to help the troops who are risking their lives to protect you. So, you know, the government knows that whenever there's a war, there's emergency, they can, you know, they can rely on patriotism as a cloud, as a smoke screen. And then they can go and they can pass all sorts of legislation that the public would never accept in peacetime which is one of the reasons I say America has lost every war, because every time we fight a war, we lose our freedom. We lose our liberties. And the same thing happened with the war on terror. The terrorists won, not because they knocked down those buildings, right? I mean, that was, of course, a victory from their point of view. But the real victory is that America is less free today because of what they did. And a lot of the loss of freedom is not because of the terrorists. It's because of what our own government did. It's how our own government used that opportunity. They used the act of terrorism and the fear that it creates to usurp more power. And there's that old saying that if you value safety more than liberty, you'll end up losing both. And unfortunately, that's what's happening. Now, I also want to make a comment. You know, I'm here in Puerto Rico and I, I'm, out, I'm out here by myself. I'm not with my family. I'm by myself. And um, I went to the, to the supermarket. I, had a, I mean, a grocery store, and I had to buy some stuff. And I don't normally do my own marketing. You know, I'm married, you know, and either my wife or the housekeeper, you know, goes to the market. So I haven't, I haven't really been in a while into a, into a supermarket and actually done like a whole grocery shopping with the cart and going up and down the aisles. I mean, I did this, you know, in my bachelor days, but I haven't really been doing any, any marketing. But this is the first time I've really been out, to, out here by myself. And so I went to the, to the, to the market and, you know, and I get behind the, the cash register and I, you know, I bought all my groceries and you bring them up to the checkout. And of course, you know, there's always a line there. I mean, there's always a few empty registers and people are lined up and you think like, you know, like, you know, they have a few extra registers. Why don't they, you know, hire a few more people? They could easily have more people. We'd have shorter lines. But the most interesting thing was that there's nobody there bagging the groceries, right? The person who is ringing up the, the, uh, the purchases, the items, as he rings them up, he sets them aside. And they're all just piling up. And I didn't realize that I was supposed to bag them myself. I haven't, I mean, and, you know, I, I just, my remem- you know, memory was that the guy that, that rung it up also bagged it. Although back in the day, I was a bagger. That was my job. I, when I was in junior high school, I think I was even in eighth grade, seventh or eighth grade, I had a job working at a supermarket in Manhattan. And I was I bagged groceries. That's what I did. I also did some delivery, but a lot, most of the time I, I was just bagging stuff. Right. I stood there at the end of the uh, the the register, and as the cashier was ringing everything up, I would put everything into the bags, and then I would put it into the shopping cart uh, for whoever happened to buy the stuff. That was my job. I did that after school, and I remember I got the job because a friend of mine worked at the same supermarket, and he said, "Hey, you know, you want to get a job here?" And why did I get a job when I was 14 years old. I mean, why did I want to work? I wanted some money. I wanted some extra money so I can buy some stuff, so I can go to the movies by myself. I didn't have to ask my my mom for money. I go to the movies or I can buy a new record. I didn't have to, um, you know, some of you who are listening to this podcast might not even know what records are, but those these are these things that we used to buy long before you could download music for free. But um, so, I, you know, I needed money, but and I had jobs. And now, you know, here I am in Puerto Rico. There's lots of unemployment in Puerto Rico. A lot of young kids don't have jobs. And there isn't a single person in that supermarket bagging the, the groceries. Why is that? Right? Why aren't there people there? I mean, the answer is obvious, right? And it's not automation. There's no robots. There's no robotic baggers, right? There, there, there wasn't a machine that was bagging my groceries. The grocery bagger job did not disappear because of automation. It disappeared because of the minimum wage, because of wage laws, because of payroll taxes and workman's comp and all the other things that drive up the cost of labor and make it too expensive for supermarkets to hire baggers. Right Now, obviously, people would prefer to have somebody else bag your, your, your groceries for you, the checkout lines would move faster. Although if you're doing it yourself, I suppose it's the same speed. And I guess it's not that big a deal. I mean, most people, I guess, 
if you know if if it were just a toss up, yeah, sure, I'll let let somebody else do the bagging for me. But I guess if it comes down to having to pay more money for your groceries, then people would rather bag it themselves because that's why the baggers are gone. I mean, the supermarkets would probably be fine hiring some extra kids to bag the groceries if they could raise prices to cover the costs. But what probably happens is if one supermarket tries to do that and another supermarket doesn't, then they have lower prices. And people at this day, when the economy is as weak as it is, people just, they'd rather bag it themselves. They just don't have the extra money to make it possible for the employer to pay the wages that are high enough to meet the minimum wage and all the other obligations that employers occur when they hire somebody. But this is bad because these jobs are gone. I mean, these jobs, uh, it, you know, they, they fulfill a purpose for young people. Yes, people can bag their own groceries. They could do it. But think about what's lost. I mean, first of all, yes, it is. It's nice to have somebody else do it for you, to have some personal service. I mean, so consumers have lost that benefit, having somebody put their groceries in the bags for them. Oh, by the way, I didn't even realize it. I had to pay for the bags. They were 10 cents a piece. I forget most people there were bringing their bags. So not only were they bagging it themselves, but they were bringing their bags to the supermarket. They don't give you the free bags. So not only do you have to bag it, you got you to gotta bring your own bags. And it, I, I didn't, so I had to pay 10 cents a bag for the, for my, for, to put my, uh, to put my uh, groceries in. But thinking about it or forgetting about the, the fact that you know, people lose the service, right? Now they have to do it themselves. Like you have to pump your own gas instead of sitting in the car you know, and having somebody else pump it. And that's, you know, it's especially difficult if it's raining outside. And yeah, usually, you know, there's a roof there, but sometimes there could be wind and, you know, you could get wet and it might be cold out if you're in the Northeast and it's winter, you got to get out of the car. And then, you know, you got to take your glove off. And all, you know, a lot of these self-serve uh, gas stations, they disable the mechanism that allows you to just keep the, the pump on. So you have to hold it the whole time. You have to grip on that thing and you got to hold it the whole time it's pumping. So, you know, it's inconvenient. And, you know, you, you, when, when kids used to do it, they would wash your windows. Yeah, you could wash it yourself. You can get one of those squeegees and try to do it and try to find the paper towels. A lot of times they're out of paper towels. And so you start washing your windows. Then you don't even have a way to dry it. Right. Maybe you even may end up making your windows dirtier. Um, you know, you could check your own tire pressure. You could check the the uh, the. Um, oil levels yourself, but people used to do this for you while you sat in your car. You didn't have to get out, you didn't have to do anything. And then, you know, not only that, when you left these old gas stations, they would give you green stamps. They, would, If you went to a gas station, I don't know, five or 10 times, you got a prize. I mean, they did all kinds of stuff. None of that, they don't do any of that now. But getting back to the supermarket, all these grocery baggers, all these jobs are gone. What, you know, what benefit did these jobs provide? Well, a, to me, a 14-year-old kid, 15-year-old kid, when I had these jobs after school, and I delivered pizza. I mean, I did different things after school when I was living in New York, right? What did these jobs do? Because they didn't pay me a lot of money. I can't even remember what I earned. But it wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough. It was enough that I could do stuff, right? I could go to the movies, right? I could buy a record. I could do stuff with the money. But what benefit does, does do these jobs have? Well, first of all, a young kid learns responsibility. I had to show up, right? If it was my shift, I had to be there, right? If the employer was depending on me to come, if I had, because I work, you know, I didn't work five days a week, but they would have a schedule and I would have to volunteer. And if I told the boss, yes, I will be there. I'm going to work, you know, I'm going to work uh, four to seven or I'm going to work, you know, sometimes I work evening. Sometimes I work on a weekend. I took a, I took a Saturday, if I told them I was going to be there, I had to be there. They were depending on me. I had to show up. I had to be punctual, right? And then, you know, I had to, you know, it wasn't hard work, but I had to do certain things. And you have to learn how to do tasks. You have to learn how to get along with your coworkers, follow directions from your boss, interact with customers. I mean, these are all little skills that people need to learn in life. If they're going to have jobs, if they're going to start companies, there's a lot of very good work experience that goes along with these low-paying jobs, right? And you don't have to raise a family. I mean, people are going to say, well, let's get rid of the minimum wage. I mean, you know, and then you know, these grocers will be able to pay people, you know, $2 an hour to bag groceries. I mean, how are you supposed to raise a family on $2 an hour? You don't raise a family as a grocery bagger. I mean, if all you could do is bag groceries, 
don't have kids. I mean, I was 14. You think I had to raise a family on the money I earned bagging groceries? I didn't have any rent. I didn't have to pay any money for food. I, I, I had no costs. Whatever I earned was gravy. My mother didn't charge me rent. I didn't pay my own medical bills. I didn't pay for anything. But by getting that money, I had something that I, that I earned. And that was another valuable part of the lesson that kids don't have today. Learning the appreciation for money, earning money, and then spending the money that you earn, right? Because when you just spend money that your parents give you, okay, you'll just spend whatever you get. But I used to think about it. When I earned money, when I worked a hard day, I remember delivering groceries in the snow, in snowstorms, and I would work hard and I'd get some money. Now, before I go out and buy something, I wanted to make sure I really wanted what I was buying. I didn't just want to squander that money because I knew how hard I worked to earn it. And now I had it and I was going to spend it wisely. So there's so much that is learned. These low paying entry level jobs are very, very important to young people, to the economy. And, you know, by the way, it's nice because it improves the level of service uh, in, in, in retail and the whole experience. All that is gone. You've got all these unemployed kids in Puerto Rico. Why can't any of them be packing groceries? You know, in addition to making a little change, they will learn valuable life lessons that will make them more productive uh, citizens, more productive workers, more responsible. You know, and I remember back then, too, I even had a bank account. I could put money in the bank. They don't, they, I don't even think kids have bank accounts these days. I mean, I don't think, even think the bank's will allow an account that's that small a balance to be on their books with all the paperwork. I mean, I mean, it was easy to open up a bank account back then when I was a kid. I opened up a bank account and I got interest on it. You get a passbook bank account. We didn't have ATM machines back then. I actually had to get online, you know, and talk to a teller. But you can put money in the bank that you earn from your job and you can get interest on it. I mean, kids aren't banking these days. They're not doing anything. They're not banking. They're not working. They're just walk, they're just at home playing video games. You know, wouldn't it be better if they could have jobs? Wouldn't it be better if it was legal for them to actually work and get some responsibility to make some spending money? And of course, that's good. You know, if the kids have some of their own money, it's not always having to hit up mom and dad every time they want to do something. But I mean, these are the things I'm thinking about. I don't know how normal people, if they start thinking about this stuff when they're online at a grocery store. And of course, you know, if the wage laws were lower, I mean, we have a lot of unemployment in Puerto Rico. Why can't there be a cashier at every uh, cash register? Why can't there be a bagger at every cash register? Be you know, because of the labor laws. You have all these people not working. Obviously, they could take those jobs if they were legally allowed to be hired. But of course, you know, if you have, you know, welfare and things like that, too, then a lot of people are like, well, you know, why should I take this low paying job? when I can take a welfare check, but that's not the case with a 14 year old kid or a 15 year old kid. You can't go out there, I guess, and get welfare at that age, right? So the only chance you have of earning money is with a job. But of course, you know, now, you know, since you can't legally get a job when you're 14 or 15 years old, how do kids in the inner cities who are 14, if they want some extra spending money, how do they make money? They commit crime, they deal drugs. You know, like the most entrepreneurial young kids, the kids that really have something going, like in the inner cities, you got a 13, 14 year old kid, right? What is he doing? He's joining a gang. He's dealing drugs. He's working because that's where he can get a job, right? The, 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 the labor laws don't apply. There's no minimum wage. When they hire these kids to, to be lookouts or to, to run money here and there, or to, I mean, I'm not even sure what they do, but there's all kinds of jobs in the gangs for younger kids to do, and they can all make money because none of the labor laws apply. It's unfortunate. And there's actually a lot of very good entrepreneurs in the inner cities who are in the drug market, right? Why aren't they in legitimate businesses? Of course, one of the reasons is because drugs are illegal and now you have these huge profits there. And so obviously you can make a lot more money if you, if you go into the drug business than if you go into some normal business. And of course, if you go into the drug business, you're not dealing with the income tax and the payroll tax and OSHA and you know anti-discrimination laws and wrongful termination laws. I mean, you, know, you just have to deal with you know your rival gangs and maybe you have to whack a few people now and then and you know maybe you run the risk of getting whacked yourself but maybe that's so small compared to the risk of having to deal with all the rules and regulations that normal businesses have but can you imagine if some of these young kids in the inner cities if 
drugs were legalized, and so all those profits weren't there. And if we rolled back all the regulations so it was easier to start a business and hire people, a lot of these kids could be doing very productive things and could be making an honest living uh, legitimately, but the government forces them into crime. And again, a lot of these young kids who never get a chance to get a job, if they can never get any on-the-job training, because certainly they're not learning anything in school. What do they learn there? Nothing. So the government puts them in these government schools where they learn nothing, makes it illegal for anybody to hire them so they can never get any on-the-job training. So what are they going to do? All they can do is law and crime. That's what they learn. And then you know what? They go to jail. They commit some crime when they're young. They go to jail, and that's like a university for crime. They spend all this time in jail, and they learn all their better ways to commit crimes from, from career criminals who could you know, teach the younger kids you know, what they know. This is what the government is doing with all these rules and all these regulations. We just need to repeal them all and have a free market and forget about all this populism and all this, oh, you know, these workers are getting exploited. They're not getting exploited. Nobody gets exploited in a free market. It's the government that exploits people. Entrepreneurs give people opportunities. They don't exploit people because people have a choice. Do I want to avail myself of this opportunity or not? It's the government that doesn't give anybody a choice. The government says, take it or leave it. And if you don't, you know, we're going to send you to jail. Thank you.